Um, and I think one of the most exciting things that's happened for me personally over the last year has been that I've become reincorporated into the world of internal medicine. And I'm so excited to be part of a clinic uh, on at 865 Northern. Um, so I hope with that background, it's gonna be a little bit obvious why I chose this article, um, you know, in, in kind of reacclimating to clinical life, it became very clear that chronic diseases are as common, if not more common than they were when I last uh, cared for patients uh, back at Bellevue Hospital, and that was 10 years ago. Um, so the notion of thinking a little bit more about how we could expand the history and physical, something else very near and dear to the heart of any physician, and certainly an internist, was very appealing to me and that's why I picked this article. Um, you'll see that it's also an article that delves a little bit into um, validity criteria, which I think is something important as an educator for us to think about. So I was kind of excited that this was a group that took on not just a trial to look at the benefit of what you will learn today to be an expanded history and physical, but also to make us understand what evidence we look at to say this is a good tool. This is something that we might want to use. Um, so uh, as, as Alice said, I'll be speaking today. And I'm also just want to say thrilled that Dr. K is, is here with me. He is a role model uh, as a physician, as an educator, and certainly as somebody who appreciates the value of history and physical examination. So it is truly an honor to, uh, to speak with him, uh, with, speak as his partner today. Um, Okay, so uh, webinar housekeeping is what we will start with. So as you see, video is, is turned on. Okay, audio is available through, I think, I hope everyone's okay. If you should be muted right now, um, but if you have any questions during the course of our webinar today, you know, feel free to speak up. I really hope this is more conversational than anything else. Um, although certainly I have a, you know, a short presentation to give and our webinar will be available um, for viewing in the future. So I'm gonna to turn to, I think Dr. K has a couple of opening questions for our group to think about. Tom, unmute. Should I, also, I guess the questions I'm asking you to think about as go through Judy's presentation, I wanna thank her for that very nice introduction. The feeling is mutual, but how are you currently approaching the history and physical exam in your clinical setting for patients who present with chronic disease? Do you focus on the patient's goals and priorities and developing your management plan? So when you are speaking, we like you to specify your setting and the learners that you have with you. So we try to build a sense of community here. Does anybody have any thoughts to these two opening questions that Dr. K posed? Anybody would like to speak up about how you feel you're currently doing things and what is your focus from anybody who's attending? Well, I'm an attending, but I, I'm a hospitalist. So I can say that I really don't focus on the chronic disease at all because everything I deal with in the hospital is generally an acute on chronic. Uh, presentation. So I'm excited to hear about this. Thanks, Karen. Anyone else? Rosemary, anything you want to say? You work in the outpatient setting. Yeah, I mean, I've just been seeing a lot of new patients. So I'm still at the stage where I'm gathering the sort of whole information. And I can't say I'm spending any more or different energy on the chronic diseases versus just the whole knowing, you know, everything. That's helpful and, and welcome to, uh, to Northfield Rosemary. And Rebecca, I hope it's okay if I call on you. Do you, do you have anything to add um, from your perspective? There might be two Rebeccas here. Who do we have? Are you calling Rebecca Schaefer? Yes, if, if you, if it's okay. Hi, yeah, um, so I mean, reading this article, I definitely, um, there were aspects of it, especially I just finished residency that we, I think it's kind of like dependent on how much time we had. And I wish that we had more time to like, to go into all these factors, but I was part of like a specialty clinic within 
um, my residency clinic that really, uh, it was like an interdisciplinary approach to it. And so we actually did have um, a little bit more time. We had like a pre-huddle where we did focus on a lot of the psychosocial factors. Um, but I know that, um, you know, it's hard um, to put that into every single time that we see like a new patient or every visit, but definitely we're able to do some of the aspects of this sort of 360 HMP, um, but that was because we, I was lucky enough to be like part of that clinic. All right, well, thank you. And and hopefully what today is about is, is for people to see, you know, how this is possible and how a tool might drive that kind of care of a patient. So um, thank you all for uh, for the contributions and, and uh, let's get started. So the goals for today are that we are going to introduce this, I am going to introduce this innovative method of gathering biopsychosocial elements. Um, in this case, it really came from um, the measurement of uh, students as they performed with standardized patients in OSCEs, which I, I imagine that everyone on this on this call knows about. We're going to speak a little bit about validity evidence, as I said, and we're going to then discuss the, the implications of an expansion of the, his, of the history and physical. They called it the HNP 360 as an intervention to actually improve the care of patients with chronic disease. Um, so I hope this is a very, uh, this will be a common scenario for, uh, for many doctors or something that, you know, no matter what you do, you can relate to. Um, so the patient is a 55 year old man with a history of diabetes for the last 10 years. The patient presents with a chief complaint of burning in his toes bilaterally for the past six months. His diabetes has been poorly controlled with a hemoglobin A1C in the range of 10 to 12. He takes metformin once a day. He has not visited his ophthalmologist this year and over the past two years and reports a seven pound weight gain since the start of the pandemic. So I hope that that is a case that everyone can relate to. Um, so as a point of background, um, and, and diabetes is, is, is one of several typical um, chronic diseases that we manage, uh, we know that chronic disease is common and costly. 90% uh, of every healthcare dollar goes to treating patients with, with chronic disease. Um, that's a staggering number. It's three of every, a little bit more than three of every four dollars spent goes to, goes to treating chronic diseases. Um, four in 10 adults have two or more chronic diseases. And 47% of the total cost um, of chronic disease is actually attributed to obesity. So pretty staggering numbers. Um, and with this in the background, um, the care for a patient with chronic disease cannot be the, the typical care of seeing a patient um, as an, in, you know, for me as an internist, seeing a patient once every couple of months, um, it really needs to involve a whole system. And the chronic care model that was designed, this goes back many years at this point, involves contribution from the community, the health system, uh, really acting in coordination as a team, um, to produce a patient who's informed and activated. Um, and that, act, that word activated is really important because it's about being proactive in healthcare, but um, reliant and working in concert with a prepared and proactive practice team. And it is only with all these elements in place that we can hope to achieve improvement in outcomes and kind of take away from those dismal numbers we just saw. So in caring for a patient with a chronic disease, um, I hope that it is uh, evident to everyone that there's a lot of history that needs to be obtained. And we heard Rebecca talk a little bit about this, um, but um, these are some domains of history taking that have been put together by experts. Um, six of these eight domains came from a group um, led by Dr. Williams, and two more were added by the group that took this study on. That's the AMA Chronic Disease Prevention and Management Group. Um, and these are important because they're really cardinal elements that people believe are necessary to hear from a patient, to, to, to you know, abstract from a patient in order to best care for them if they have a chronic disease. And I wanna pay, I want the group to pay particular attention to these eight domains because they will come up over and over again during today's talk. 
So perception of health. This is what is asking the patient, what is the perception of your health? What are your goals and priorities? Uh, delving into psychosocial concerns, uh, relationships with others, who can they re uh, rely on? Resources that they have accessible to themselves um, via family or community their functional status, and biomedical factors. So if we think about our typical uh, history and physical, or history, I would say, they don't always include, um, and they, they rarely actually will include all of these factors. Um, so it is with understanding that this is the necessity, the domains, that these domains are the necessity in caring for patients with chronic disease that we bring us to our article today. And that is this group said, you know, we have to do better. We have to create a history of physical and H&P that incorporates and encompasses all of those domains in order to to best care for our patients with, with chronic disease. Um, so that's what we'll really focus our attention on today. Um, so ev as everyone here knows, the h &P has a long history in medical education. Um, we expect it as a dean, as one of the deans of the medical school, I'd say this is the absolute one of the minimal, minimal expectations of our graduating students. Uh, we call these EPAs today for entrustable professional activities that every student graduating has to be able to conduct a complete history and physical exam. In fact, our students start this on day one of medical school, and that is the case in many medical schools these days, that we start learning how to take histories and physicals early on. Um, it is clear that the traditional h &P has not been updated to reflect chronic disease, and I would even say that's the case at our school, um, is that it's if you look at those domains, um, the typical h &P lacks attention to those domains. Uh, but it is important, and that's why this group, again, the AMA Chronic Disease Prevention and Management Interest Group, took this on. So the research questions that were addressed in this paper, uh, I'd say one is actually a goal and the other is a question. So the goal is that, they that this group um, describe the development uh, administration and validity, again, we're going to come back to validity in a moment, um, evidence for this expanded H&P 360, um, which measures students' abilities to collect key biopsychosocial uh, information and not only collect that information, but you'll see that it helps um, motivate and direct uh, providers to synthesize a management plan that is attentive to all of those elements. So that is a description and one of the outcomes of this paper. And the other is a question that was asked and answered, and that is, what is the impact between learners using this expanded H&P 360 versus a traditional H&P? And that's what we'll answer today. So reliability and validity, these words get thrown around a lot whenever we're talking about um, uh, tests, experiments, uh, research, et cetera. And I thought it's you know a nice opportunity to just delve into this for a few moments. So what we're gonna talk about today is validity, not reliability, but what is reliability? Reliability is the extent to which outcomes are consistent when an experiment or a test is repeated more than once. So are we gonna get the same results a second time. And validity, which is what we are focusing on today, is the extent to which the instrument that it are, that's being used, in this case the H&P 360, is, is measuring exactly what we want it to measure. That is what validity is. So the question is, you know, when we say something like a, um, a tool is valid, how are we able to conclude that is the question. And uh, to answer that, we go back to a framework of what is validation. What is the evidence that we need to look at? What are the categories that allow us to make that statement of this is a valid tool? Um, so again, just want to spend a few moments on that because it is such a, a critical part of this paper. Um, these are the five categories. This comes from a framework by Messick, um, again, dates back to the 1980s, um, but these are the five categories. So test content, very briefly, is providing evidence to demonstrate that the content of a test is related to the learning that it was intended to test. Uh, response process demonstrates that the assessment um, requires a, a person to en engage in specific behavior necessary to complete the test. Um, internal structure actually delves into and examines the relationship between the scores 
on individual test items um, and make sure that they align with the construct, um, or in this case, in our example today, the domains that they are intended to assess. Um, this relationship to other variables uh, asks for evidence to demonstrate that a score measuring a defined construct, or in this case domain, is comparable to scores on other tests that exist like it. And testing consequences asks uh, for evidence to describe the extent to which consequences of the test are congruent with the proposed use. So, you know, I, there are a lot of papers about validation. This paper happens to go into a great deal of evidence about this, and I thought that's why it's important to, to just think and explore what validation frameworks actually mean. So with that as background, what did this group do? Um, so after they built the HNP 360, which we're going to talk about in, in just a few moments with more detail, they recruited medical students across four uh, schools across the country um, who are all actually involved in a, an AMA-sponsored project called Accelerating Change in Medical Education. Um, these were MS3s and MS4s, and they totaled 159 students evenly distributed across the four schools. Um, these students participated in, two, in one of two OSCEs. Um, the students, once they were randomized to one of the two OSCEs, were also randomized into a group which utilized the HNP 360 and another group which utilized a standard HNP. Um, they, in participating in the OSCEs, the people who uh, rated them were SPs, and they were experienced SPs who were well, well trained, ten, more than 10 hours of training before they were ever allowed to, um, you know, to be a rater for this, for this study. Um, and finally, they provided, the study provided the validity evidence um, that we just went over, and I'll go into a little bit more de detail about that, but not too much. So how did they build this HNP 360? So it was a long and iterative process, and it really started with um, understanding those domains that we talked about before. Um, this group brought together faculty members from 15 medical schools, um, and because this was a tool intended to be used on students, they brought students into this discussion as well. So they brought students together from non-medical schools and they built a template, which you're gonna see in just a moment. Um, they role played this template and from that, they learned that they needed a little bit more than just a template. Um, and they decided they needed an interview instruction guide, which they then went on to uh, create and pilot before, again, before they ever used this in a test in an experimental setting, they piloted on 144 medical students. Um, so that's how they built the HNP 360. And what, how is this HNP 360 different than our traditional HNP? So what you see here, and this will go on for um, two more slides, um, are some areas in black which are more traditional, the HPI, the history of present illness, uh, biomedical problems and concerns, more typical. The ones in red are the ones that align with the domains that I presented before. So these are the ones identified as being more important or, or really instrumental in caring for a patient with chronic disease. So for instance, patient perception of health. This domain encompasses patient understanding and insight of disease of their illness, um, their, the, uh, their own self-assessed level of control, and very importantly, their own strengths and barriers. Um, patient priorities and goals means that there's attention paid to actually uh, documenting and asking about what are your priorities, what are your goals in treating this illness. Uh, psychosocial problems and concerns um, in, uh, addresses the mood, thought uh, pattern of the patient, um, as well as pertinent social issues that we need to understand in order to care for patients in this complex chronic disease model. Um, the social history similarly encompasses more than what we would typically think of as the, the, the traditional uh, social history. It includes very specific um, attention to relationships with others. Um, who is your support system? Who is going to help you? Who is going to drive you? Um, uh, because we understand that caring for a patient with 
chronic disease requires that. Um, resources, this domain encompasses food security or insecurity, housing stability, financial resources, and so forth. And then functional status, what are they like? What are, how are they functioning on a daily basis? And finally, the assessment of, and plan in this HNP 360 is more than just the problem-based assessment and plan, but includes these items as well. So a shared assessment of the level of control, a trajectory of this condition, shared goal between physician and patient, um, psychosocial influences, strengths and barriers, and what is the team going to, uh, to do? How is the team going to intersect with this patient? Um, so I didn't say all the pieces, but you see it's a lot more comprehensive but aligned with what is, see, what is seen as important in caring for a patient with chronic disease. So I know when I read this, at, you know, my, the beginning of reading this, I was a little bit overwhelmed, um, but I was also inspired to think if I had an h &P, if this was taught from the beginning, I would always be thinking about these elements um, as I cared for patients. And I think that's what allowed me to persevere. And on the other side of my mind, I thought this doesn't have to happen in one visit. This is an h &P that happens over multiple visits. This is about longitudinal care with a patient um, incorporated into a team. So um, moving into our our experiment, as I said, the student was randomized to one of two cases. So as with as much effort as was given to the creation of the H&P 360, the authors created two OSCE scenarios um, using a, a, you know, similar or parallel um, iterative process. And the two OSCEs that they chose, one was a patient who was poorly managed with type 2 diabetes. A second was a patient who was slightly overweight with hypertension. And a student was randomized to each of the, one of the two of these. And then uh, within it, half of the students um, participated with the expanded and half the students participated with the traditional HNP. Um, in order to measure how students performed in these uh, stations, a 24 item checklist was developed. Um, so the max score on this OSCE, if they were perfect, they got a 24. Um, most of the items on this checklist were, um, were dichotomous, meaning yes or no, the student did it or the student did not do it. Uh, but there were, a, there were a few that were partial, meaning the student did it, the student didn't do it, or the student partially did it. And while all of these items um, blueprinted to the, again, going back to those same chronic disease domains, there were also a portion of checklist items that were really just about communication skills. Um, and those 20, those, all of this material is actually part of the material that we sent out. Um, and just to tangent for a moment there, I know me personally, like I don't always go to the appendices uh, of an article when I read it. I read it in the journal and I kind of leave it at that. This is one time where the appendices held a, a tremendous amount of information. Um, I know it was long. We heard people printed it and didn't realize it was 74 pages long. But if anyone leaves today thinking, wow, this is something I'd really like to learn more about, um, they really give us everything, including um, checklist items and, and OSCEs and, and, so, and, and certainly the template itself. So um, it was really valuable. Um, so the statistical analysis that was done um, was just four things I'm going to very briefly describe. Chi-square, this is, was used to examine comparability in the demographics of the group. You'll see that the groups are even. We use t-tests to compare between, uh, to make comparisons between groups. Um, Cronbach's alpha and factor analysis were really used as part of the um, validity criteria, but they uh, allow us to delve into the actual test questions. Um, so you'll see those those revealed. So the results, what are they? Um, so this is the validity evidence. Um, the long and the short of it is that it's a valid tool. Um, and I won't go into all the detail because I did before, but basically in each of those five areas, when we said, what is the evidence of validity, this group could come out definitively and say, this is a valid measure. And I think it's really important to understand that. I can't uh, emphasize that enough because you wouldn't want to be uh, you wouldn't want to have 
a tool like this and an experiment um, and not have it validated because that means that we couldn't, but you know, we couldn't comfortably use it. But I think if people uh, think there's merit to this, uh, at least this group shows us, demonstrates why, um, why it is a valid instrument. It's going to measure what we think it's going to measure. Um, as far as the student characteristics go, there are two tables. Um, I will very quickly walk you through it. This is the characteristics of the students um, in table one by, uh, by full participants. So we have the full sample of students. We have the control, meaning uh, the students who, um, who use the traditional model. And then the treatment are the people who um, use the expanded HNP 360. And there's no difference among the groups. Um, in fact, there's no difference at all. And this goes to specialty, because they did ask the students, what specialty are you going into? The year in school, I said that there were threes and fours, male versus female, and which uh, case they were part of. There was a small um, difference among sites. Only when you look at the site one, site two, site three, and four, only uh, with regard to the year Study, but basically, you can conclude from this that there are yeah, very evenly uh, matched students. And this is the big table of um, of outcome. Um, and and I I boxed in red what this means. So when we looked at this uh, their performance on these OSCEs with this max score of 24, the control group, meaning the people who um, who use the traditional H and P, they scored a mean of 10.99. And the treatment, the students who use the expanded 360, um, their mean score was near 16. Um, that was a, a difference with a, a p-value less than 0 0.001. And what you don't see here, but I will tell you, the effect size of this um, is large. It's extremely large. And it means that the impact of this modality, the HNP um, 360, was, was, was large. Um, and these differences uh, hold true even when you look at, at groups uh, like primary care, their, you know, their special, their chosen specialty, their year in school, uh, male versus female, um, everything means that everything shows us, and even with insights, everything shows us that there's a big difference between the control group and the treatment group. So um, that's what this revealed. Um, we have some questions for discussion, and um, yeah, I want to open it up. So, uh, Alice, you look like you were going to say something. All right. I was just saying, hey, Tom, you want to open this up a little? Sure, absolutely. Um, these were just some um, questions that we put together ourselves, but we certainly would appreciate any questions that there are from the audience is how they currently practice the H&P and how the new 360 degree HNP would actually change what they, how they actually perform their HNP, and how would it better um, address the patient's own priorities and goals? I think this is very interesting, and in that it perfectly reflects how we changed our HNP once once we're actually in the clinical setting. So you know, it was definitely not um, a priority in the you know, traditional h &P as a medical student. And then through the trials and tribulations of logistics in the emergency department, when we're saying, okay, they can go home. They can, well, can they walk? Oh, I don't know. Oh, do they have someone at home to receive them? Oh, I didn't ask that. Oh, who takes care of them anyway? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, they can't bathe themselves. They can't even, they don't even have a walker. So it's really funny because once we got through the first couple years of residency, we actually formulated a very similar 360 approach where we say, okay, like, are, how are you doing? Are you hungry? Like, can you even eat? And just simple things like that. So this is fantastic that we um, start this process in medical school. I think we're going to have better candidates <laughs> rotating through the emergency department. This is really wonderful. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. That is so helpful to hear. Um, and, 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 emergency you know, department are you with? I'm just want you didn't identify where you are, Jennifer. muted. Jennifer. That can you repeat? Which department? Where, well, that where are you located? Oh, I'm at uh, Staten Island University um, in the emergency department. Great. And so you have medical students coming from CUNY there, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, we do have a very 
we have a very specific approach to this at, at Zucker. So uh, <laughs> it, it's our approach. And I'm just wondering, how do you find the medical students that are coming from CUNY and this idea of you talking about an expanded social history as important? Absolutely. Um, they're certainly competent. They're very bright and eager. They work really hard. Um, but just, um, you know, incidentally, once we start, you know, getting a patient prepared and thinking about discharge, um, these are the things that, you know, aren't really in the history and physical necessarily. So then we get to these points and realize that, oh, okay, we need to think more of a, like when they get home picture, what are, what is their home like? Um, who's there receiving them? And, and so I think this entire process will facilitate that. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a great comment. And it, I'm sorry, is someone else talking? No, go ahead, Tom. Okay. I mean, I think this is a very important um, concept that you're doing in the ED because it relates to what Dr. Brenner spoke of before. You don't necessarily have to apply all these things to every patient. And, or if you do, you can do it over time. Now, there'll be certain parts of this that are more relevant to the ED practice that are not as necessarily co as comprehensive as they, as they might be in a physician's office. So by you identifying these additional factors that are important to the patient is a great way. And I'm really uh, quite excited that you are doing this in the ED on a regular basis because that often does not happen. Right. Does anybody else want to comment um, either to the contrary of Jennifer or agree with Jennifer about what is she saying? Um, Tony, I see you're on. Tony Sicarius, long time. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. How are you? Can I'm you so hear happy me? to see the name. I wondered, I know you work in a specialty area that this might be very relevant to. Um, you could introduce yourself and unveil what I mean, a specialty area, and say yes, that. Yes, of course. So go ahead. Yes, so good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm a GYN oncologist by training. I work in um, the central region, North Shore and LIJ. Um, and as related to our specialty specifically, it's really quite imperative and essential that there is a more well-rounded 360 approach, as you can imagine, related to we do surgeries by training, but also we do post-surgical care and recommendations uh, regarding chemo and radiation therapy. So this component is really quite crucial to assess a patient's pre-existing concerns, pre-existing limitations, both physically and emotionally. Um, and this is a, a wonderful um, sort of change in paradigm, frankly. Um, we find that a lot, you know, when we're with our learners, whether students or the residents or fellows in training that we have, which we're blessed to have, that um, uh, initially a lot of all of the input and energy is going to the medical part of what's transpiring. Um, but then indeed what we really, and that's always been one of my interests in really honing in on, so, okay, we're here on day one of admission to the hospital. <clears throat> how are we looking at discharge? How are we getting her to discharge? How are we making that safe and effective and matching up with her and her family's goals? Or if, if she's alone, did you know she was alone? And um, what have we done with or to her that could have changed her capacity to function at home independently? So that's in the domain of surgery or in the domain of um, having had recent chemotherapy, for example. So I think this would be absolutely a much better approach and paradigm. I do um, respect what Dr. Brenner was saying is related to the time though. Um, I could see how <clears throat> in a busy clinic, um, all of this couldn't be done in one session, certainly. Thank you, that is... Um... I certainly think I agree, you know, for... GYN oncology, this is so important, this information, how could you function without it? Correct, exactly. Any other discipline would like to speak up? I've sort of called on everybody I know. Uh, I'm trying to see who's here. Any other discipline would like to speak up? So what about the, sec the next question, Tom? Go on to the one that's in orange, red color. What do you think about that? We haven't talked that much about physical exam as history. It's mostly history. Yes. Right, the 360 is history, but the history drives the physical exam. And by getting a more thorough social history and, other, and also patients' goals and objectives may direct you to focus on certain parts of the physical exam in more detail than others as, um, and we do do a standard physical exam on all patients, 
but they don't necessarily take into account, for instance, this patient's loss of sensation in there. Well, I guess that might, might happen in the past as well. But let's say the patient is not all wants, all the patient wants to do is to be able to get out of bed, go to the refrigerator, watch TV. I mean, they want to a level, achieve that level of independence. In our current um, evaluation of patients, we don't go to that level of detail. And I think that knowing what the patient's priorities are and needs, we can build that into our physical exam and use it as a kind of a, a barometer of reaching the patient's goals and objectives. Or not goals and objectives, but goals and priorities. Yeah, I can. And I, want, I wanted to add to that because uh, at one point in this, I think in the limitations, it said that like they didn't analyze whether the students collected um, bio, uh, the psychosocial information at the expense of the key biomedical information. But, um, and I get that maybe like time is an issue, but I, at least from experience, I have a feeling that when they actually did explore further, they probably did a better job at getting the appropriate biomedical, or at least in the real world, that's, there's been many times where by asking certain questions like about their home life or whatever it is, their social determinants of health, I, I, I went back to like a symptom that they had mentioned earlier, or like, I'm like, oh, I think I need to further explore something that they had men sort of mentioned sort of casually before. I'm curious if, um, if there was like a further study, I have a feeling that it would not be at the expense of that. And if anything, it would enhance it. I think so. And I, I, I'm glad you brought up the limitations because that is one. There are others as well, um, but but minor ones. Um, it, one of the things is there may be a different um, curriculum around Crohn's disease at each of the institutions, um, and there is more work to be done for sure. They actually had people document their histories um, uh, and phys their, their histories, and that is being done now as an analysis as well. Um, but you're right, like, I guess that's why I keep on coming back to this idea that this isn't a one-off. This is about a relationship that you build with a patient, but this is a tool, a modality to help capture that information and um, use it with, with somebody over the duration of time. Um, and that does allow you, Rebecca, to go back and say like, you know, you said, you mentioned that, like, can I hear a little bit more about it? Um, but as I was reading it, I know, and reflecting on being a preceptor, I, I, you know, I, I always think about how uh, the approach, especially of, of, you know, of newer physicians is, you know, I have to get all that biomedical information and, you know, come up with like really amazing complex plans that are really not going to, you know, just too, too complex to happen and probably off base from what the patient actually really wants. Um, so I think that's what attracted me to this article. Um, I thought it was just, it was so practical. <laughs> I mean, one thing I think that is really important is that this incorporates the social determinants of, of health, which are so um, important in determining the patient's care plan. I mean, we may touch on it in our current history and physical exam, but we certainly don't do a complete uh, or at least near complete um, evaluations of all of the various aspects of the social determinants of health. And um, I think that's a, one of the important aspects of this new evaluation tool that is very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see uh, Dr. Slagle also has a uh, her hand up, so I'm going to call. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So it's interesting when you teach uh, not only the soccer students, but also national students, and you ask them to come up with ideas for programs generally, right? Social determinants of health is on their number one top list. I saw so many programs that students created because it was such a, an urgent need when they, they said, we don't, we don't get this and we know we need this and we see that people are suffering. So it is definitely on students' radar. So I think this is very much, this is very much in time, very burning, very accurate topic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. People know it and it comes naturally as we heard, um, you know, we heard already. Um, and now we can imagine like what if the EMR actually facilitated um, obtaining this because there was a field for every one of these elements. So you don't have to like wonder where do I put it in, um, you know, how do I add it to an already lengthy H and P, but it's actually built in to help you um, care for patients with chronic diseases. Alice, I think you're muted. Trying to stay moody. I'm in an office by myself. I don't know why I think I'm <laughs> muted, but it's just out of habit. 
Um, I did make in the new app I have on just in time teaching and there that's in Apple and Google play. There is a JIT, a just in time teaching tip on how to incorporate the social determinants of health into the precepting encounter. So all of you who work with learners as, um, was said by, um, I think it was Dr. Reyes, if I got her name, if I remember correctly from Staten Island, like they've learned they've had to do this, but it doesn't mean the learner in front of you knows how to do this. So you might have to prompt them in the precepting encounter and say, well, why don't we talk about the history you got on the patient's you know, insurance or how they, how they go to the supermarket or whatever. And you might have to prompt them in your precepting and this um, JIT is specifically on prompting for that expanded social history. And I think it's important to do that. We can do a JIT on the HTTP 360 apps. Right, we, I guess with permit, we could ask those authors to contribute one because anybody who does one um, certainly um, couldn't get credit. I think you know, I think what's very important though is this is a very comprehensive change and that using SPs to actually educate students and how to do it correctly would be very important because otherwise we might incorporate bits and pieces. But I mean, I think having a full understanding of the goal of this particular approach and the ability to demonstrate your ability to do it is also a very important part as far as the medical student or resident is concerned. So I just put that JIT in the actual chat if anybody wanted to just see the one JIT I'm talking about. You know what, Alice, I'm going to try to, um, let me post, let me. So I just want to ask something though, and I want to make a comment. I hope people can comment on this. And then I'm going to let Wendy go in one minute to close us out. So this is how to precept what Judy put up and it goes down and it talks at top about the social determinants of health. And then it goes in how to precept this if you keep going, keep going. And the five micro skills to precept this. So it's very, very practical. I just wanna ask, you know, this, the, everybody talks how there's so much less physical exam going on. And I know you're all clinicians, but I actually just went for my annual and I was very impressed with my primary care. It's an annual, I only go once a year, thank God I'm healthy. And she did a very thorough physical exam on me. So I was like impressed because you know everybody's talking how everybody's in a rush and people do focus physicals. And I think it's important if you don't do the comprehensive physical, you may not get to the need for this expanded social history. Any comments on that? Like the physical, as Tom said, prompts the, what you questions. Any, Tom, any, anything on that? I'm sorry, are you talking to me, Alice? Well, anybody, because when we think about the physical in many environments, people are doing focused physicals now. So in a focused physical, to get it a, a diagnosis, there's a good chance you don't connect all this. That's okay, go ahead, Ro. Okay, I'm gonna play the, the naysayer. Okay, go ahead. So the physical exam in an annual exam for someone like you who's healthy is mostly theater. It's mostly so the patient feels that they have had their hands laid on and that something was done. It is unbelievably rare that I'm gonna find an unexpected finding on a head to toe physical exam that I'm not otherwise looking for that didn't, I didn't get clued into from my history in which case it's a focused exam in that area, okay? Um, so I disagree that I expect to find anything and that it helps me somehow take care of the patient's sort of psychosocial things. I think more, more would be, you know, I was in a practice where for a new patient, I would walk in the room and the patient would already be gowned. And I would say, oh my God, you can't do that. I wanna see the patient in their street clothes, talk to the patient in their street clothes. Looking at the patient in their street clothes tells you a lot about the patient, right? So there are many other ways to get, and then if there's four kids in the, in, the, in the office with them, you know that that young mother or somebody has nobody to take care of the kid. There's other clues you can get in other ways and parts of your interactions with patients um, that, can, that can also clue you into these things. 
Okay, that's interesting. I, I appreciate a contrary opinion. Absolutely. Um, I think Dr. Reyes and Dr. Schlegel also have a comment. So I want to, Dr. Reyes, would you like to uh, to answer? And Sorry, I was just trying to look for the app um, and I found a couple for SDOH. I just wanted to confirm it's an actual app that we can download. It's an app called JIT. So it's, I'm putting it in the chat. It's J-I-T-T -T infographics and it's in the Apple store and Google play. And that app has many oh, infographics. It. This is one of them. Okay. Jennifer, you're going to love it. It has a ton of one. Yeah. And Jennifer, um, I'd love to talk to you uh, offline about maybe some contribution to it. But I just want to give Wendy one chance. Or wait, wait. They, oh, Elizabeth. Okay. And Wendy, get your slide up and then Elizabeth, or pro progress the slide for Wendy. Yes. Yeah, and Elizabeth? Oops. Yeah, so basically, now I just want to contribute. My annual is kind of scary because it takes a couple of days and they're really, they're really serious about it. And suddenly I get this whole thing of what could be wrong, which then, you know, knocking on wood never is. But, but it's probably because I don't have several kids with me. I'm in, alone in my office, but it really takes a couple of days and they're very strict if I don't show up. It's, it's quite interesting on the, on the time when it's time to talk with me about the results or the finding or lack thereof. So it is, it is kind of scary every time. Different, different. It uh, is different, yes, it is. Wendy? Do you want to close Thank this you. out before we go to conclusions? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, this will only take a couple minutes, but um, we will be looking at the bibliometrics, um, uh, specifically through the altmetric um, platform for this particular article. So if you see on the left-hand side, um, it tells you in which um, which platforms this particular article was mentioned. Um, there were two news outlets. Two of them were actually um, news pieces that were produced by the AMA um, about this. Um, and it's two separate kind of posts that they had created um, and they refer back to this particular article. Um, also, if you look at um, the number of tweeters, so there are five tweeters um, who have tweeted something about this particular article. Um, and there was an upward bound, upper bound of um, close to almost 23,000 followers for the six users. So that kind of gives you an indication of exposure, at least, of the article to um, to the to the you know to readers. Um, one thing I always like to highlight is the number of Mendeley readers who've saved this particular article onto their Mendeley library. There's been studies that indicate that Mendeley reader statistics are um, better indicators for the article being cited back um, compared to, let's say, a, a tweet. Um, so there's 10 Mendeley readers. And what was very interesting, actually, was that um, they, it gives you statistics of the demographics of the Mendeley readers. Um, the one that you see here on the on the slide itself are um, the demographics of who accesses the article. But if you um, look at the Mendeley demographics, most of them actually were students, um, which was very interesting um, as opposed to, I think there was one researcher, but um, a majority of them were students. And um, there were two of, uh, students who associate, or two users at least, who associated themselves with the social sciences as opposed to medicine. So it's um, very interesting in terms of kind of overlap or just kind of, con you know, overlapping, I guess, between different subject areas and that it, it wasn't specific to just medicine. Um, and then, like I said, this is a breakdown of the demographics of um, the people who've accessed this article, a majority being from the US. Thank you. I think is interesting because History and physical, I think, has, you know, medical education in Europe is six years most of the places. It's a whole different system. What's interesting here, there, I don't see Canada represented, or are they? Does that map include Canada, Wendy? Um, it, Canada is not represented. It's U.S. and India, and one unknown. In terms so it's of very interesting. Because Canadian medical education is very prominent, and I, I find it interesting that this article was not accessed through Canada. But just to give you an example, I read this article in its paper version, its print version, so you'd never capture uh, those of us who get it that way. Um, so.
Okay, we want to go back to the conclusion side, Judy. All right, well, I, th I think we'll end. We're at 1257, so this should be uh, this should hopefully be evident from the discussion that using the HNP 360 uh, that students were able to abstract more biopsychosocial data. Um, this does have educational value in teaching and assessment. Um, the results are reproducible. The validity evidence is strong, and um, you know, students are collecting this information. We kind of have an understanding of that, that this template might facilitate this process. Um, and as I said, use this over time. Do not think this is a one-time H&P. It is overwhelming. And in fact, I didn't go into this too much, but some of, you know, when, when asked about, when asked after the exercise, they asked students like, you know, what the experience was like. And they did find this a little bit more challenging, but that's because they had to do it in a short period of time. Um, so thinking about this as more of a long-term instrument is probably a, a more worthwhile um, way of thinking about it. So great. Tom, do you want to say any concluding remarks? No, I mean, I think this is a very important addition to what we are currently doing. And I think, uh, we are missing a lot of information from our patients because we don't address certain aspects of their health, uh, which are some of them being non-medical that would really influence our decision-making regarding our assessment and plans. So I think this is really an important step forward in improving our ability to actually get an accurate history in physical, or at least a more comprehensive history in physical to guide the correct management plan that these patients need. So um, I really want to thank our speakers today. I think this is a very important article and the session is recorded and we'll be stopping the recording in just a minute. And it will be posted on the faculty development website within a month. And I just want to go to the last slide, Judy, please. Sure. Uh, I think Antoinette also Antoinette, had a question. You could ask your question while I'm going to the last slide. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was just going to say as well, I think there could be a role though for at least uh, those of us who use TouchWorks uh, EMR for the outpatient setting to modify some of the fields to make this approach a little bit more straightforward, you know, to have a prompt even, you could establish a prompt that would force sort of that evaluation or that question to be raised. And that could be a team effort, you know, with additional office staff assisting in that endeavor. But I think on a sort of IT level, it'd be nice to optimize to allow for the 360 um, h &P to be more easily done going forward anyway. You, in the all scripts, I think there is a secret many step process to find a SDOH screening tool that does exist. Uh, believe me, I'm not the oh. person to tell you that, but anybody you know who knows all scripts, there is a hidden SDOH screening tool that is in all scripts. I've heard this, so I, I need to look for it. Sure. Ask a scripts person. So I just want okay. to thank Rebecca for being on today. Rebecca Schaefer is our presenter next month on a very, very important topic. Talk about history and physical um, and physicians attitudes and beliefs and communication skills in clinical schools around patients who are suffering with obesity. Um, it is not necessarily a lifestyle choice for sure. I have a to be a registered dietitian and you know, had a great investment in this topic in my other life. And it happens that March is National Nutrition Month just by chance. So Rebecca is speaking on a topic very relevant to National Nutrition Month. And we appreciate anybody doing the Survey Monkey. Um, giving us feedback is welcomed and encouraged. And anybody who would like to present on book for this year will end the year in April in um, May, and then I'm looking to build for my September calendar. And I want to thank all my presenters, Wendy, Judy, and Tom, as usual. And um, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. It was great to, great to meet with you today. And Rebecca, we look forward to watching your uh, journey.